Good afternoon and namaskar to all the fellow colleagues from the universities and various colleges. Welcome to the sixth and the last day of this live conferencing of this online program on NEP 2020. Today we have with us the Pro Vice Chancellor of Indira Gandhi National Open University, Professor Uma Kanjilal. Professor Uma Kanjilal, faculty of IGNO, library science background, but took several initiatives related to the technology in the university. And she's still taking those technology initiatives. One of the national coordinators of Swam Prabha and Swam. She is a Fulbright scholar from University of Illinois, and she was a principal investigator of National Virtual Digital Library, sponsored by Ministry of Culture, which was housed in Indira Gandhi National Open University. I'll not get into the detail of her publications and so on, but extensively written on technology. We welcome you, Professor Uma Kanjila, for this last session on, again, technology-related issues, whether SWAM, SWAM Prabha, or what are the initiatives of Government of India. Thank you, and over to you, Professor Uma Kanjila. Today I'm going to talk about National Education Policy 2020 vis-a-vis -vis digital education. If you have gone through the policy document, you must have seen that there is a great emphasis on use of digital technology and in fact two major sections are focusing on use of technology in both in school sector as well as in the higher education sector. Uh, if we go to the section 3.5 in the NEP 2020 document, uh, four major aspects have been highlighted. First one is it is talking about improving teaching, learning and evaluation processes. Then the second one it talks about supporting teacher preparation and professional development. This is in the context of using technology, especially the educational technology and the disruptive technologies that have come in. And it, in fact, uh, refers to uh, large-scale capacity building requirement that has to be uh, brought in. The third aspect that it talks about is enhancing educational access. So which means uh, providing access to the technology to all the stakeholders, the teachers, students, administrators, and that's a major important requirement, in fact. And if you go further, you will see how to go about it. It's clearly mentioned in the document. So that's where one important area because we talk about digital divide. So if we are talking about digital education, I think it's very important that we have educational technology infrastructure in place and each of the stakeholder has access to the uh, required technology. Then the fourth aspect it talks about streamlining, planning, management, and administration. That is in terms of the e-governance. So it talks about the higher education institutions as well as the school uh, uh, sector also 
to adopt e-governance and put things in place. So these are four major aspects that have been mentioned in the policy document. Uh, if we further move on to section 3.6, it talks about a uh, rich variety of educational uh, software that needs to be developed and made available for students and teachers. And again, if it is, it's not just developing, it, it has to be made accessible to all. So this is very important aspect that has been focused on. Then the set, second aspect it talks about is, it has to be made available in all different Indic languages. So it's basically we get software either in English or maximum in Hindi. But it, uh, in fact, in the National Education Policy 2020 document, if you see that it is stressing on use of uh, uh, regional languages to a great extent. So, I mean, all the softwares are to be developed, keeping in mind that the regional requirements and the language, there should not be any language barrier. So that's an important aspect that has been focused on. Then coming on to the third aspect, it is, says, accessible to a wide range of users, including students in remote areas and Divyang students. So I think what it refers to is providing access not to just the computing technology, it should be also the internet, web, and in fact, last mile connectivity that needs to be put in place. Then the fourth aspect, it talks about teaching learning, e-content, which is already, I mean, the process started with the National Mission on Education through ICT in 2009. This needs to be further extended and large scale development of e-content and e-resources generation is very much required. And in fact, all the stakeholders, the states, uh, central government, all the institutions involved in the process needs to go get into action in developing engaging e-content. And that's also in all regional languages. Now coming to the different platforms that developed over the years, and if you look into the national education policy document, it clearly states that there are already certain platforms like Diksha, Swayam, Swayam Prabha, which is our operation, and in fact, not going in for any duplication of effort. So whatever platforms are already available, that has to be actually enhanced further to, uh, I mean, upgraded further to, uh, I mean, uh, fulfill the requirements of digital education that we talk about. In fact, if you look into the Disha portal, it's basically for the school sector, and you will see that it is, I mean, it talks about one nation, one digital platform. So it is actually integrating uh, all kinds of facilities right from open educational resources that have been developed, live classes that they're talking about, uh, e-courses, e online courses, so all are actually available on the Diksha Pro platform. And it's not just web-based, it is also available on the mobile phone. And if you look into, I mean, already 22 states are involved in the process, and if you look into the statistics, I mean, huge number of participants are already there and have been extensively using the Diksha platform. Now, coming to the higher education, uh, a major intervention that was done by the Ministry of Education is the, uh, I mean, implementation of the SWAM portal. Uh, basically, I mean, if it's the acronym for Study Webs of Active Learning for Young Aspiring Minds, and it is basically uh, India Moves. And the best part is it is a world cast made in India platform. So it has been developed in India for India for all the, I mean, and with indigenous technology. Uh, in fact, if we talk about massive open online courses, that is MOOCs, uh, the whole uh, initiative worldwide started in 2011. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, India is a late starter. So we had major players like edX, Coursera, Udemy, Future Learn. We have been actually very successful and large millions and millions of participants uh, I mean, going through all those MOOCs courses. So in that context, if you look into, I think uh, India was a late starter. We started somewhere in 2016, offering our courses with, uh, uh, I mean, we piloted for some time and, and, and extensively from 2017 onwards, started offering courses. 
but already in a short span of time we have been able to catch up with the world leaders and actually if you look into the statistics that are there we are actually among the top five now so very short time this swayam platform has become a major success story for the government of india and it's being extensively used so if you look into the statistics that is there that the total number of co courses that have been developed this is our i mean in terms of unique courses somewhere around 2598 courses and it's growing in fact uh, in a uh, big way in fact and till date in front starting from 2016 onwards more than 8000 courses have been offered and these courses basically are rerun also so made i mean the number is growing like anything and if you look into the cumulative enrollment that is there till date i think we have have already uh, more than 2.76 uh, registrations on the so important total certification issued so far is 11.66 lakhs we are for, uh, in fact waiting for the last sessions result to come out and this number will increase so i mean uh, if you look into the registrations uh, data it's quite high but that way the certification is not happening i think there needs to be an intervention that needs to be put in and all the institutions the higher education especially higher education institutions need to work towards it make i mean i mean uh, inform their learners make them aware about uh, the platform that is available and it needs to be also embedded with the uh, curriculum structured in a manner so that you have credit transfer also possible and in fact as on date we have somewhere around 159 uh, institutions higher education institutions who have adopted the SOAM courses for the credit transfer for their students so this is actually also again growing in a big way apart from this uh, course wise registration on SOAM we have a SOAM vertical 2 and this vertical two provides for a platform it's kind of an lms which provides the uh, for uh, any institution to offer online uh, courses so if any of the institutions they are uh, in, interested in offering some online programs uh, say mba mca whatever it is uh, they can just i mean at a ug level pg level they can just have to uh, approach swam team and they can actually offer their uh, i mean this is as it has been provided by the ministry it's uh, available for all and they can offer their programs uh, through the vertical too and in fact this uh, capacity building this fdp program that we are running is also working on the swam vertical too itself so this is how i mean swam has been growing and it's getting really popular over the years and the best part of it is it's the unique feature that we have is it follows a four quadrant approach so when we talk about four quadrant approach what is it uh, in the first quadrant we talk about providing high quality video lectures multimedia simulation animation uh, etc so basically if a course is a four credit you get uh, around 20 hours of video content or multimedia content available in that course and then the second quadrant is the e-content or the self-instructional material, text-based material. It could be e-books. Uh, you can provide links to open educational resources, open access journal articles, books, etc. So that's the uh, second quadrant of this uh, SOAM. The third quadrant is the assessment part where you can include assignments, quizzes, problems, solutions, etc. And the fourth quadrant is the most important, which actually brings in the interactivity in the online courses that are offered on SWAM. That is the discussion forum. And since you have been using the same platform already for this FDP, so you are already familiar with the platform itself. And in fact, uh, I mean, it's not just for the interactivity. One can also think in terms of using the discussion forum as a platform for assessment as well. So, and in fact, it's the interaction, if you see, it's almost like real-time interaction happening. Apart from the four quadrants, there's another quadrant, in fact, uh, the ministry insisted that all the national coordinators go in for, for the, all the videos, transcripts are to be provided. And these transcripts are to be actually, uh, I mean, uh, required to be uh, used for the purpose of translating into 12 regional languages uh, 
uh, another important thing is that uh, I mean uh, it's not just going through an open course on SOEM. Uh, well, I got an instruction that I should also speak in Hindi. So I will try to speak in Hindi. So I will mix Hindi and English so, so that it, I mean everyone ben benefits. So I have said that there are four quadrants of courses to available hai, open courses. But if someone needs a certificate, then how will get a certificate? Milega? So in that case, actually, uh, NTA, that National Testing Agency, Pura country mein, they have centers spread over the country and uh, online exams are conducted. So you can see the kind of facility that's uh, in the screen that you can see, the kind of facility that is being provided by NTA. So it's may proctored exams hota hai, all centers may online mode be it could be computer based examination or it, in case of subjective programs, I mean subjective courses, wo pen and paper based be ho sakta hai. Uh, another important aspect which is the unique uh, selling point of SOEM is that credit mobility. And if you have seen in 2016 the first gazette notification came from UGC as well as AICT in which they said that if you are doing a course with SOEM, you can use your credit for your degree. And after that, there is 20% credit mobility and credit transfer. And after that, there is 20% credit mobility and credit transfer. और इसमें ये भी बोला गया कि हर इंस्टीट्यूशन हायर एजुकेशन इंस्टीट्यूशन उनके स्टैट्यूटरी बॉडीज के थ्रू अडॉप्ट करना चाहिए सो विद दैट एक्चुअली आई थिंक दैट ब्रॉट इन एंड इन फैक्ट अर्लियर आई मेंशन दैट 159 इंस्टीट्यूशंस ऑलरेडी हैव अडॉप्टेड दैट सो ऑल द इंस्टीट्यूशन नीड्स टू गेट इन बोर्ड ताकि वो भी अपने थ्रू स्टैट्यूटरी बॉडीज दे गेट uh, this, in fact, uh, adopting the courses that are available on SOEM and make it part and parcel of the, uh, I mean, curriculum itself. Uh, recently, in 2021, the new gazette notification came in, it is only 20%. Now, it is saying that you have 40% courses of SOEM. In every semester, you have 40% courses of SOEM. And the credit hai, Usko aap use kar sakte hai aapke degree ke tarah. I mean, uh, towards earning your degree. So that is how, I mean, this whole uh, credit mobility works. And best part is it gets actually linked with the academic bank of credits. So jitne students, jo learners hai, jo courses swam se kiye hai, unka jitna earn, uh, I mean, credit earned kiya hai, after giving examination and clearing, uh, continuous assessment as well as term and examination or certificate issue hota hai. Ye sub certificate unke credit bank mein jata hai. So let me mention about the academic bank of credit. Iska bhi mention agar aap uh, NAP document mein dekhenge, iska bhi clear cut mention hai. Or UGC has come up with a academic bank of credit ka regulation, I mean uh, guidelines also. So basically you will ask what is it? What is like, it's like a bank account. Only thing is instead of money, you whatever you have earned towards your, I mean the certificates or the credits you have earned towards a course that gets accumulated in a uh, ABC portal. So basically it is a virtual digital storehouse. Or her in, uh, student, I mean they can actually open account, wo unko register karna hoga ABC ke through or NAD, jo nat, national academic depository hai, uska account hai, to uske through bhi wo log register kar sakte hai, to usko link karna hoga. Aur jab aap register kar rahe hai ABC portal mein, aap ek jo student hai, uska unique ID create hota hai. Us ID ko leke wo claim kar sakta hai, apna credit for transfer in fact. Achha, another important thing is, uh, this facilitates multiple exit and multiple entry points. Our student during their whole entire education tenure, they can just pick and choose courses, drop in, drop out, and use, I mean, then at the end of the day, tenure, if they have earned the sufficient credits that are required, it can accrue towards the degree and they can claim their degree or diploma, whatever it is. Uh, and in fact, the way it works, it's the credit transfer is, I mean, you can see in the features also that I have put in, you can visit the site of ABC and credit is transferred seamlessly uh, from their account. It only thing is that the host institution has to agree and it should be part and parcel of the curriculum so that it can be added towards the degree. 
this whole portal is in fact, I mean uh, the facility is powered by DigiLocker or iska jaise maine pehle bhi bola tha national academic depository mein linked hai to unka jo certificates pura complete degree jo aapka nad mein available hota hai aur abc mein jo aapka course wise certificates hai wahan se aayega to isko combine karke complete degree so interlink of abc and nad is there uh, another important intervention from ministry of education i would like to mention is the swayam prabha channel this is basically meant for last mile connectivity ab web ke liye internet ke liye connectivity ka issue ho sakta hai to hum bar bar access ki baat karte hain to agar last mile connectivity karna hai i think multiple channels we have to have to reach out our learners channels in a sense that it's not just web based or mobile based online courses you can think in terms of using uh, tv channels for the purpose of that सो so, ये स्वयं प्रभा का भी जैसे इन फैक्ट इट्स बेस्ड ऑन द जी सैट फिफ्टीन दैट वॉज लॉन्च इन टू थाउजेंड एंड उसमें 24 ट्रांसपॉन्डर्स में से 15 uh, दो ट्रांसपॉन्डर मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ एजुकेशन को दिया गया था 2016 में और आई मीन फॉर द पर्पस ऑफ ओनली एजुकेशनल कंटेंट सो करिकुलम बेस्ड एजुकेशनल कंटेंट स्वयं प्रभा में Uh, 2017 से इनफैक्ट अवेलेबल uh, होना शुरू हो गया है एंड इट इज़ अवेलेबल 24 फोर बाई सेवन सो ये 34 फोर चैनल्स जो अवेलेबल है और अभी रिसेंट जो डेवलपमेंट है एक तो अभी बजट दिस ईयर्स बजट इनफैक्ट इट वाज डिक्लेयर कि 200 सौ चैनल अब अवेलेबल होगा तो 34 फोर एजुकेशनल चैनल्स जो थे पहले इनिशियली जब था मेजर चंक ऑफ द चैनल्स वेयर विद हायर एजुकेशन एंड थ्री फोर चैनल्स वेयर विद द स्कूल सेक्टर देन देर वॉज अ डिसीजन समटाइम इन टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी कि उसका बारह चैनल वेयर टेकन अवे फॉर द स्कूल सेक्टर क्लास वन से ट्वेल्थ के लिए इंडिविजुअल क्लासेस के लिए एक एक चैनल और बाकी जितने बाईस चैनल्स थे वो फॉर हायर एजुकेशन तो उसके बाद अभी क्या हुआ जो रिसेंट डेवलपमेंट हुआ है बजट में जो डिक्लेयर भी हुआ दो सौ चैनल खाली स्कूल सेक्टर के लिए आ रहा है तो अब इसमें क्या अरेंजमेंट होगा जैसे ही वो स्कूल सेक्टर के 200 चैनल यूज होना शुरू हो जाएगा 34 फोर चैनल्स विल बी मेड अवेलेबल फॉर हायर एजुकेशन एंड अपार्ट फ्रॉम दैट इनफैक्ट देर इज़ अ प्लान एंड आई थिंक वेरी सून वी विल बी हैविंग अराउंड 60 मोर देन 60 चैनल्स फॉर हायर एजुकेशन सो एडिशनल चैनल्स वी आर एक्सपेक्टिंग और ये चैनल्स इनफैक्ट uh, आप अगर देखेंगे इसका एक्सेस आपको बेसिकली uh, मिल जाएगा डी डी फ्रिश डिश टी के थ्रू आपको खाली आई मीन फिफ्टीन हंड्रेड रुपीज़ का एक इन्वेस्टमेंट करना है और सेट टॉप बॉक्स ले लेते हैं तो आपको थर्टी फोर चैनल्स अवेलेबल हो जाएगा तो जितने स्वयं प्रभा चैनल्स यू कैन एक्चुअली यूज इन द इंस्टीट्यूशन कॉलेज आई मीन डिपार्टमेंट्स एंड यूनिवर्सिटीज एंड एवरी वेयर दिस फैसिलिटी नीड्स टू बी पुट इन प्लेस एंड इट कैन बी इंटीग्रेटेड विद classroom i mean can be very well blended with the classroom teaching also another important thing is jitne hamare live sessions ya regular every day 4 hours fresh session minimum hota hi hai aur usko fir repeat kiya jata hai to is hisab se pura din available hota hai ab ye jo jo live sessions ya jo bhi recorded sessions jo fresh content available kiya jata hai uske uske baad hum archive karte hain aur usko aap agar if you miss out Uh, in the real time you can actually go to youtube and have a look into the archive videos swayam prabha ka apna ek mobile app bhi hai to aap apne mobile se bhi usko access kar sakte hain apart from that it is available through jio tv and dish tv swayam prabha ka ek portal hai jiska maine bhi yahan link bhi aap ko dikha rahi hu swayamprabha.gov.in isme agar jayenge isme aapko program schedule beforehand mil jayega Uh, सब जितने YouTube archive videos हैं उसके links मिलेंगे uh, One can search, browse through uh, the portal and search for subject or I mean different metadata for the content that is available. और उसमें uh, feedback mechanism भी available है एक मैं interesting uh, use of स्वयं प्रभा आप लोगों के साथ share करना चाहती हूँ Ignu के पास चार channels हैं और हमने recently in fact January सिक्स टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी टू हमने क्या स्टार्ट किया है एक लाइव सेशंस रेगुलरली कर रहे हैं रीजनल लैंग्वेजेस में सोशल साइंस सब्जेक्ट्स के लिए और एवरी डे तेरह घंटा थर्टीन आवर्स ऑफ लाइव सेशंस आर बीइंग कंडक्टेड 
and it is in 13 languages uh, which includes 12 regional languages and english as well aur every day char channel mein humne distribute kar diya hai to abhi itne short span mein humne already 2000 sessions i mean ek ek ghante ka sessions to aap keh sakte hain 2000 plus ghante ka content already generate ho chuka hai और अक्रॉस द कंट्री डिफरेंट रीजन में हमारे रीजनल सेंटर्स हैं वहाँ से कंडक्ट करते हैं और इसके लिए बहुत ज़्यादा बड़ा कोई इन्वेस्टमेंट करने की भी ज़रूरत नहीं है यू कैन हैव अ स्मॉल स्टूडियो जस्ट सेटअप इट विल कॉस्ट यू समवेयर अराउंड वन लैख और मैक्सिमम टू लैक्स एंड यू कैन क्रिएट अ स्टूडियो एंड गो लाइव यूजिंग दिस फैसिलिटी इन फैक्ट ऑफ स्वयं प्रभा सो दिस इज समथिंग दैट इज अ यूनिक फीचर दैट इज देयर और इसके सक्सेस को देख के ही ये जो आपका एफ डी पी प्रोग्राम एन ई पी का हो रहा है हमने भी डिसाइड किया वी विल यूज द प्लेटफॉर्म एंड इसी अभी जो ये भी सेशन चल रहा है दैट्स रनिंग ऑन द सेम प्लेटफॉर्म आप एंड ऑलरेडी आई थिंक यू आर अवेयर अबाउट इट सो दिस इज अ यूनिक वे ऑफ रीचिंग आउट लर्नर्स नॉट ओनली इन 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 द रिमोट कॉर्नर्स लास्ट माइल कनेक्टिविटी भी प्रोवाइड कर रहा है अपार्ट फ्रॉम दैट टीचिंग इन मदर टंग को भी एक प्रोमोट कर रहा है तो दैट इज समथिंग वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट आई थिंक दिस इज अ मेजर इनिशिएटिव एंड वी प्लान टू गो इन अ बिग वे एंड इन फैक्ट वी आर एक्सपेक्टिंग फोर मोर चैनल्स टू बी कमिंग टू इग्नो सो वी विल बी एक्सपैंडिंग इट टू ऑल आवर प्रोग्राम्स इन फ्यूचर अब अगर आप डॉक्यूमेंट देखेंगे एन ई पी में इसने उसमें काफ़ी सारे डिस्ट्रप्टिव टेक्नोलॉजीज का मैंशन किया है क्या है इट टॉक्स अबाउट आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस इट टॉक्स अबाउट वर्चुअल रियलिटी ऑगमेंटेड रियलिटी ब्लॉक चेन और नए नए टेक्नोलॉजी की बात की है तो मेजर चैलेंज वो है कि आप कैसे उसको इम्प्लीमेंट करेंगे अगर हम बात करते हैं एंगेजिंग कंटेंट के लिए आई थिंक द इम्पॉर्टेंट थिंग इज यू नीड टू अंडरस्टैंड हाउ ए आई कैन बी यूज हाउ यू कैन एम्बेड ए आर वी आर इन योर कोर्सेज एंड हाउ यू ब्रिंग अबाउट दिस आई मीन मेक अ पार्ट एंड पार्सल ऑफ द टीचिंग लर्निंग प्रोसेस डॉक्यूमेंट में यह भी बोला गया है कि देर शुड बी एम्फोसिस ऑन रिसर्च इनोवेशन इन दैट दोज डिस्ट्रप्टिव टेक्नोलॉजीज और इसके लिए नेशनल रिसर्च फाउंडेशन शुड बी वर्किंग टूअर्ड दैट तो देर इज अ मैंशन अबाउट नेशनल रिसर्च फाउंडेशन जिसका फोकस ये डिस्ट्रप्टिव टेक्नोलॉजीज लेटेस्ट अपडेटेड एमरजिंग टेक्नोलॉजीज है उसमें काम करें देन द थर्ड इम्पॉर्टेंट मैंशन इज अबाउट National Education Technology Forum. So the whole uh, idea about NETF is that it will identify emergent technologies market में क्या available है और उसको कैसे आप teaching learning के लिए adopt कर सकते हैं So I mean in a mass scale adoption, uh, how we can go about it? That's how actually NETF is going to work on. So let us talk a bit about the disruptive technologies that I mentioned. Uh, जैसे आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस की बात की है आप इसको कैसे यूज़ कर सकते हैं और आज के दिन में बहुत सारे ओपन सोर्स टेक्नोलॉजीज अवेलेबल है एंड यू कैन यूज़ इट सो अगर आप डिजिटल एजुकेशन की बात कर रहे हैं या ऑनलाइन एजुकेशन की बात कर रहे हैं देन इट कैन बी यूज फॉर द पर्पज आई मीन यू कैन यूज इंटेलिजेंट ट्यूटरिंग सिस्टम्स यू कैन यूज पर्सनलाइज लर्निंग कस्टमाइज पर्सनलाइज लर्निंग कैन बी डन जस्ट बेस्ड ऑन द एनालिटिक्स दैट इज जनरेटेड देन the ai tutoring ai based tutoring teaching assistants can be created i mean you can bring in even robotics in the whole process you have adaptive learning approaches can be adopted then na natural language processes uh, chatbots i think many uh, platforms you see chatbots are being used basically ye jo chatbots hai it's driven by uh, artificial intelligence uh, then you have conversational artificial intelligent agents that can work it can be used for the purpose of big data uh, data mining etc and the best part kya hai aaj ke din mein jitne learning management systems ya mooc platforms hai they are having all these features inbuilt in them and it can be extremely used for the purpose of online learning uh, or virtual learning uh, ai ke baad jaise kar rahe hain to i think i need to mention also about uh, big data and learning analytics in fact uh, you can use it for purpose of uh, i mean uh, link data can be used which can be embedded to in the whole curriculum design based on student profiling real time usage course feedback transcript analysis staff skills etc 
So it can be extensively used for that purpose. It can help in just in time interventions. Kahi koi student lag kar raha hai, to identity skill gap analysis aap kar sakte hai, and engage your students online using the big data or learning analytics. Then personalization, already I mentioned about it, and based on the demographic details, profile of the learner, it can actually, and their study history, how they study, how what is their, I mean, how they perform, and all those aspects, data can be captured, and customization, personalization can be done. Then, uh, I mean, big data can be also used for the purpose of multimedia indexing, uh, say common images in videos, jo popular hain, wo identify kare, or uh, usko be actually may be used for the purpose of understanding uh, the fitness of the content, e-content that you have developed. And uh, it can actually, apart from that, it's not necessary that you use the big data and data analytics just limited to the LMS, that is the learning management system, ya uh, MOOCs platform. Ye data mining up across platforms kar sakte hai, jase social media mein bhi agar aap kuch activity kar rahe hai, usko bhi aap use ki jiye. And uh, the whole social learning, uh, I mean, information can be collected from different platforms and integrated with the, uh, uh, I mean, your basic learning management system or MOOCs. Uh, let me talk a bit about augmented reality, virtual reality. I think ye bahut extensively ab log baat karne lage hain, aur iska emphasis aap agar uh, NEP 2020 document mein dekhenge, already there. Our best part hai, bahut sare services, applications, platforms aapko freely milta hai. So open source kafi sare availability hai. To ek to hai ye second life aapne suna hai kya nahi pata nahi aap ek baar visit kijiye. Usme it's a platform to create, I mean you can create virtual campus, you can create universities, colleges, libraries on the second life platform. Aur usme kya kuch nahi aapko, you take, it's like a gaming platform. You take in an avatar, walk in, go to a library, read books, you can go to a classroom, attend classes. So that's a fantastic immersive learning environment that is created. Then we have tools like Google Cardboard, which can actually connect uh, to the smartphones. 360 uh, cities free apps, which can use 360 degree panoramic images and videos for VR. Time Looper, again, a uh, uh, freely available uh, I mean, application. It can be used for uh, I mean, VR time travel app. Ke liye. So you can actually visit locations through historical lenses. For instance, just say up Delhi ko dekna chate historical way say Mughal era me kaisa tha, to medieval era me kaisa tha. So you can actually use those things, and you can create. In fact, uh, um, I mean, you can use uh, immersive VR education and uh, near port kind of a uh, uh, I mean platforms or tools just to develop your uh, complete lesson plan. So this is how I think future of education where we will be focusing a lot on augmented reality, virtual reality, cost is coming down and extensively I think there is an expectation that will be used and I'm sure uh, NETF will actually will be providing access to such tools to all of us. A core technology which I mentioned NEP 2020 mein hai, it's the blockchain technology and it can be extensively used ho sakta hai, uh, for the purpose of education. And in fact, basically it can be used for the purpose of badging, certificates, uh, and, and, and it acts as a trusted academic ledger. Blockchain technology, in fact, can help the educational institutions in improving their record keeping, maintenance of the records, then uh, payment transactions, etc. And in fact, uh, I mean, over the time, I think we will be seeing its extensive use in uh, integration with the academic bank of credits. Uh, in fact, IGNU ka jo abhi recently humne convocation mein, humne blockchain use kiya tha certificate distribute karne ke liye. Or, uh, I mean, in one click, sub certificates were distributed. I think that's the future many of you will be adopting in future, in fact. Uh, now talking about, uh, I, I would like to uh, focus a bit on the National Education Technology Forum, which is going to be an autonomous body, in fact. Or it's, it is going to be a platform for free exchange of ideas on the use of technology uh, to enhance learning, assessment, planning, administration, etc. So actually, uh, they will be providing exchange of knowledge, ideas, I mean, uh, best practices and all those things. Uh, then the, it is going to facilitate decision making on the induction, deployment and use of technology. They will 
I mean, make you aware about the technologies that are available, what will be best suited for your institution. So, hand holding is expected in future. And third important thing is, it is actually going to build a, uh, intellectual and institutional capacities in education technology. So, that is going to be the future and we are looking forward, I think already uh, ministry has started establishing the NETF and we will be seeing the results very soon in fact, um, once it is operational. So, I will actually conclude by saying that. Uh, there is a lot of emphasis on digital education if you look into the NEP 2020 document and it is expected to be a game changer in the country which can actually help in access to oh, basic education, skill based education, lifelong learning uh, both formal and non-formal. So, I think uh, gradually hum log sab jaise gradually we are getting in fact COVID-19 taught us I mean we many of us were not using online. Uh, tools, platforms earlier, but everyone got into the bad band bandwagon of using them. And I think many of you are aware, but I think it is going to, I mean the use is going to increase further in future. It is going to enhance the quality of teaching and learning to improve the relevance and effectiveness of basic education and it is going to expand distance learning opportunities. Uh, especially for dis uh, disadvantaged groups and especially when we talk about reaching out to the remotest corners, all sorts of technologies are that being made available. Uh, it is focused on the NEP document also, it sh says that all the platforms that are there needs to be upgraded, uh, updated and enhanced further so that I mean the utility increases many folds in fact. And, uh, uh, and in fact, it is expected to also raise the GR. So, at present the gross enrollment ratio is somewhere around 27.6 percent and it is expected that by 2035 or NEP document may be clear cut mentioned hai ki it has to be raised up to 50 percent. Agar hum is level ka GR reach karna chaate hai, I think just brick and mortar facility is not good enough. I think we need to adopt, adapt to the digital technology that we talk about and then that is the future that I mean we are looking forward to. And there is a overall government policy in, in higher education which is actually directing towards promoting digital education as reflected in NEP 2020. I think we need to understand what are the technologies available, what are the facilities available and all, all the stakeholders need to get together, share ideas. I mean share knowledge and we and I think then only the um, implementation of NEP 2020 where digital education is concerned is going to be a great success. Thank you very much. I appreciate and on behalf of all the teachers, I am sure all of you, you will appreciate two things. Ek to chunki slides bani thi, aap sab ne dekha, wonderful slides she had prepared. Second important point, the content was also very good, but us content mein agar aap dekhenge, jo point unho ne highlight kiya, explain kiya, the disruptive technologies. Bohat zaga agar aap ne I am sure you have read NEP document. There is a lot of information in this disruptive technology. And we all teachers jo hai, uh, we are trying to find out a solution ki, ha, what are these disruptive technologies, blockchain, how to use it. Like you have told us how easily that teachers kaise, ya universities, colleges mein blockchain can be used in blockchain. What is virtual reality? What is augmented reality? So, we cannot implement it, but you had explained it very well. Uh, thank you so much. There are questions, but I would like to um, ask one question which, uh, which comes to my mind. You talked about aapne baat kiya OER. So, Jitna humne teen char dino mein, humne chhe, pishle chhe dino mein live sessions diye, OER pe 
अभी हमने डिस्कस नहीं किया तो कैन यू प्लीज एक्सप्लेन अस व्हाट डज ओ ई आर मीन एंड हाउ टीचर्स कैन यूज दिस ओपन एजुकेशन या इट्स आई थिंक वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट एस्पेक्ट एंड ऑल फैकल्टी मेंबर्स टीचर्स ऑल नीड टू अंडरस्टैंड ऑल्सो व्हाट इज ओ ई आर सो इट्स बेसिकली ओपन एजुकेशन रिसोर्सेज इसका मतलब क्या हुआ इसका मतलब ये है कि ओपन लाइसेंस में जो लर्निंग रिसोर्सेज है इट इज टू बी मेड अवेलेबल और ओपन लाइसेंस क्या है इसका मतलब यू कैन री यूज रीपर्पज एडेप्ट एडोप्ट एज पर योर रिक्वायरमेंट रीडिस्ट्रीब्यूट वट एवर यू वॉन्ट टू डू इट सो आई थिंक मेनी ऑफ द इंस्टीट्यूशन आर कमिंग अप विद ओ आर पॉलिसीज और इनफैक्ट ये जो टर्म है इट केम समवेयर इन एंड एज अ फॉलो अप ऑफ एम आई टी ओपन कोर्स वेयर और दो हजार दो में ये कॉइन टर्म किया गया और उसके बाद जो है काफ़ी सारे रिपोजिट्रीज ओपन कोर्सवेयर भी का, काफ़ी आगे बढ़ रहा है एंड बहुत सारे इनिशिएटिव्स भी वर्ल्ड ओवर हैपन कि जहां ओ ई आर ओपन एजुकेशनल रिसोर्स हैव बिन मेड अवेलेबल सो इट एक्चुअली इंटेल्स इट्स सो अगर हम रिसोर्स कह रहे हैं तो ये क्या रिसोर्स एजुकेशन रिलेटेड रिसोर्स हैं तो वो किस लेवल तक है इट कुड बी अ कम्प्लीट बुक इट कुड बी जस्ट अ मॉड्यूल it could be even the questions quizzes that are available so at law, so the advantage for teachers kya hai agar aap koi course bana rahe hain aur ye uh, you can actually refer to see how many i mean in, in your uh, subject area discipline area agar open educational resources agar available hai you can adopt it adapt it for the course you have in fact agar aap uh, odl and online regulations 2020 aap dekhenge उसमें भी क्लियर मेंशन हुआ है कि 40 परसेंट ऑफ कोर्स आप ओ से अडॉप्ट कर सकते हैं यू कैन क्रिएट योर ओन कोर्स यूजिंग द ओ कंटेंट डाटा देयर और इंडिया में हमारा एक जो मेजर इनिशिएटिव हुआ है दैट इज नेशनल एजुकेशन आई मीन एन एम नेशनल मिशन ऑन एजुकेशन थ्रू आईसीटी 2009 में स्टार्ट हुआ है उसमें क्या किया गवर्नमेंट मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ एजुकेशन दैट अर्लियर आई मीन एम they had actually provided funds uh, to a number of institutions to create educational resources so initially it was copyrighted jo aap use nahi kar sakte hain but 2014 mein there was a uh, i mean a concerted effort made and a decision was taken aur aaj ke din mein jitne open educational resources available have and developed under the nmi ict they were made available under the open license that is सी सी बाई एस ए इसका मतलब आप जो भी मटीरियल अवेलेबल एन एम ई आई सी टी के अंडर डेवलप हुआ जैसे एन पी टेल के कोर्स मटीरियल है ई पी जी पाठशाला के कोर्स मटीरियल है सी ई सी ने यू जी लेवल में काफ़ी सारे कोर्स मटीरियल बनाए सिमिलरली इवन वर्चुअल लैब्स आपके स्पोकन ट्यूटोरियल्स बाई आई आई टी बॉम्बे बहुत सारा कंटेंट ओवर द ईयर्स जनरेट हो चुका है तो एज अ टीचर अगर आई एम इंटरेस्टेड टू क्रिएटिंग आई मीन Uh, developing a course i it's i think it should be we should look into the open education resources and these are actually validated content ye bhi nahi ki koi bhi jaise wiki mein kuch material ho gaya wo nahi these are validated content that is coming from the best of the experts to wo aap apne course mein adopt kar sakte ho aur usko in fact integrate kar sakte ho aapke curriculum ke sath so that is how we can use the oer Yes, thank you so much because that was a very important concept you touched upon in during your presentation. Mm -hmm. और हमने सोचा कि ये वाला कॉन्सेप्ट जो है हमारी टीचर्स को हमारे जो यूनिवर्सिटी टीचर्स हैं कॉलेज टीचर्स हैं उनको पता होना चाहिए सो देर आर सेवरल क्वेश्चंस और वन ऑफ द इम्पॉर्टेंट पॉइंट्स विच एवरी वन हैज मेड दैट इट्स अ वेरी गुड प्रेजेंटेशन so the uh, that's what many many people they have written one question um is asked that explain can you explain again what is vertical platform what jo jo swayam prabha mein aapne kaha tha na second, second vertical okay so swayam ka ek to jo major platform sabko dikhai deta hai wo vertical one hai usme hamara course wise registration so usme jaise maine mention kiya tha 2000 से ऊपर हमने यूनिक कोर्सेज अवेलेबल है वो कोर्स वाइज रजिस्ट्रेशन के लिए है बट एक बैक एंड में भी वर्टिकल टू है जिसके बारे में लोगों को अवेयरनेस नहीं है एंड दैट इफ एनी इंस्टीट्यूशन इज इंटरेस्टेड इन ऑफरिंग ऑनलाइन प्रोग्राम तो वो क्या कर सकते हैं दे हैव टू अप्रोच स्वयं टीम और उनको बोलना पड़ेगा कि वी वॉन्ट एक्सेस टू द वर्टिकल टू टू ऑफर आवर ऑनलाइन प्रोग्राम 
तो जैसे हमारा स्वयं का वर्टिकल वन में काम करता है वैसा ही करता है खाली डिफरेंस यहाँ है कि स्वयं वर्टिकल वन में खाली सिंगल कोर्स आपके हैं और वर्टिकल टू में कंप्लीट प्रोग्राम डिपेंडिंग ऑन किस लेवल का प्रोग्राम है जस्ट सर्टिफिकेट अगर चार प्रोग्राम है सब कंबाइंड इंटीग्रेटेड एक जगह में आपको ऑफर कर सकते हैं और ये इनफैक्ट आप अगर अगर उसको भी आप देखेंगे ओ डी एल एंड ऑनलाइन रेगुलेशन इनफैक्ट फर्स्ट जब वो ऑनलाइन रेगुलेशन भी आया था 2017 में इट ऑल्सो क्लियरली मैंशन कि आपको स्वयं में ही कोर्सेज ऑफर करने हैं बट लेटर ऑन एक्चुअली 2020 में जो रेगुलेशन कम्बाइंड रेगुलेशन वहाँ इन्होंने परमिशन दे दिया है कि आप अपना भी एल एम एस यूज़ कर सकते हैं लर्निंग मैनेजमेंट सिस्टम द एडवांटेज एक्चुअली फॉर गोइंग इन फॉर स्वयं वर्टिकल टू इज यू डोंट हैव टू डू ह्यूज इन्वेस्टमेंट ऑन सेटिंग अप योर लर्निंग मैनेजमेंट सिस्टम यू डोंट हैव टू डू एनी इन्वेस्टमेंट ऑन आई मीन क्लाउड स्पेस और एनी थिंग लाइक दैट यू हैव अ रेडीमेड प्लेटफॉर्म यू डिसाइड यू डेवलप द कंटेंट्स फॉर योर ऑनलाइन प्रोग्राम एंड ऑफर इट ऑन द स्वयं वर्टिकल टू सो दैट्स हाउ इट इज टू बी यूज ओके थैंक यू अनदर क्वेश्चन इज कि रूरल एरिया में हाउ अ रूरल एरिया कॉलेज स्टूडेंट कैन बी टेक्नो सेवी वेल एज आई मैंशन एन ए पी डॉक्यूमेंट भी क्लियर कट बोल रहा है कैपेसिटी बिल्डिंग तो करना पड़ेगा कहीं ना कहीं तो शुरू करना ही पड़ेगा और इसमें जब हम एक्चुअली अभी जो वेट कर रहे हैं जैसे ये एन ई टी एफ एक बार प्रॉपरली सेटअप हो जाएगा दे विल गो वे आउट हैंड होल्डिंग एट द रिमोटेस्ट कॉर्नर्स ऑफ द कंट्री टू मेक टेक्नोलॉजी एक्सेसिबल और खाली टेक्नोलॉजी एक्सेसिबल करना ही काफ़ी नहीं है आई मीन पीपल शुड न्यू आई मीन डिजिटल लिटरेसी शुड बी ऑल्सो पुट इन प्लेस आई थिंक द फर्स्ट स्टेप विल बी मेकिंग द लर्नर्स डिजिटली लिटरेट नॉट ओनली द लर्नर्स इवन द टीचर्स दे नीड टू बी डिजिटली लिटरेट एंड देन ग्रेजुअली दे विल बी मूविंग ऑन सो इन फैक्ट ड्यूरिंग कोविड लॉट ऑफ प्रॉब्लम्स आई मीन दो मेनी अडॉप्टेड एंड एवरी वन हैड गॉन फॉर ऑनलाइन प्रोग्राम्स एंड ऑनलाइन ऑफरिंग ऑफ कोर्सेज बट देन देर वेर इशूज ऑल्सो एक्सेस इज इशू बट इसी के लिए एक और भी जो एडवांटेज है हमारा जो स्वयं प्रभा चैनल है वो आपका आई मीन लास्ट माइल कनेक्ट करता है टी वी का आपको जस्ट फिफ्टीन हंड्रेड का एक इन्वेस्टमेंट करना है सेटअप बॉक्स के लिए और सारे चैनल्स आपके अवेलेबल और टेलीविजन इज एक्चुअली ब्रॉडली कवर्ड सो यू डोंट हैव टू बी वेरी डिजिटली लिटरेट ऑल्सो यू हैव योर प्रोग्राम एंड इफ यू गो फॉर रीजनल लैंग्वेजेज आई थिंक दैट लैंग्वेज बेरियर ऑल्सो विल बी टेकन केयर ऑफ सो आई थिंक दिस इज दिस इज हाउ गवर्नमेंट इज वर्किंग टूवर्ड्स इट एंड वी विल बी सींग दैट इवन आई मीन ऑल नीड्स टू बी कवर्ड एंड वी शुड सी दैट देर इज नो आई मीन डिजिटल डिवाइड एंड एक्सेस टू ऑल इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट आस्पेक्ट दैट हैज टू बी कवर्ड इफ आई जस्ट एड प्रोफेसर उमा कि जो आपने कहा कि इनिशिएटिव पर हमने देखा है कि जो आज की जो नई जनरेशन है दे आर मच मोर टेक्नो सेवी देन वॉट वी आर सो हमको लगता है कि स्टूडेंट्स रूरल एरियाज में टेक्नो सेवी नहीं है बट दे आर बट बट इनिशिएटिव जो प्रोफेसर उमा ने बताया देर आर सेवरल इनिशिएटिव बींग टेकन और जैसे स्वयं प्रभा है वो तो स्टूडेंट्स uh, देख सकते हैं another question again i think which um, student teachers all of us we need to either read or understand and the good question is when and how blockchain is used by the instructor that's a question uh, basically blockchain is not necessarily used by the instructor it's the institution but then you can use blockchain even for keeping attendance so you have actually uh, i mean it's like uh, it's an encrypted technology but attendance keeping records of learners so you can use for that purpose also so basically aaj ke din mein jo educational purpose ke jo liye ho raha hai wo certification badging acha badging is another important area right so mm-hmm. jaise hum swayam ke course keh rahe hain ya i mean i mean kuch bhi agar individual courses offer kar rahe hain koi faculty you can put in the badging there there you can use the te- uh, i mean uh, blockchain technology mm-hmm. also so mm-hmm. that can be used and actually you can capture and you can link it with the learning analytics that is there and encrypt that mm-hmm. and make it available so that's possible right. so um i must share many people they have written because 
um, this will this will motivate uh, all of us. It's not a question, but congratulations for well explained presentation. Okay. Now another question is, what are MOOC resources? Explain. Can you give some example of it? MOOC resources. Uh, well, I mentioned in my presentation, MOOCs mein jo hai, humne four quadrant ka approach maine elaborate bhi kiya tha. So MOOCs jaise hai massive open online courses. So uska bhi agar ab dekhenge massive matlab large number of people are participating. So like in this case, we are going in for six thousand more plus students. That's a large number and catering to that. So platform like Swam, which is a MOOC platform, we are using it. Uh, op uh, then the second O, I mean the first O is about open. O, or, and this open has two connotations. It means open in a sense that the content that's made available or the course that is made available is available under the open license. And the other open is you don't have any restriction or any requirement of prerequisites to go in for a, a course. So that is the open. And uh, the sec second O is about online. So the, all the transactions that are happening, or if you have seen it, then everything the transaction right from registration to certification is happening online. And course is actually a structured way that is there. So basically, if you look at the resources that I have said, the content I have said, I have said MOOCs ke content we can use. Kar sakte hai, uh, I mean, four quadrant mein aapke uh, video, multimedia content, one quadrant, hai, second quadrant, you have text material, where you can use OER, you need not actually create the books, ebooks, or anything like that, or self learning material. Available OER, you can use kar sakte hai. Then you have the third quadrant, which is the lot of assessment that can be used and, uh, and it can be reused. So, whatever I'm talking about, these are all under open license. You can reuse also. And the fourth is the interaction. And one interesting thing is the discussion forum, we just think that we are just trying to interact with each other. In many cases, the discussion forum is also being used for the purpose of assessment. So, I mean, threaded discussion can be done. Give a topic, give a critical analysis, give a video, and say that you have to write, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, critical, critical review of this particular video. So this is, a com I mean, actually engaging your students. So these, in terms of MOOCs, I think these are the basic, uh, most of the platforms, these are the services that are provided on the MOOCs platform. Yes, and you rightly pointed out in the slide that uske transcriptions be available. Transcriptions be available. So that's also a very mm. important yeah, resource so uh, which is being given. Uh, another question is, I think um, the answer which we are also looking for, what will be the timeline of these mentioned educational technologies to reach out to the local parts of the country? So it's already there. I think we are, I mean, I mean, we have seen the statistics, crores of students have uh, actually registered for SOAM courses. And it's not just those who are college students, it's being used for lifelong learning, uh, continuous professional development and many other purposes. So already initiatives have. I think the most important thing is to build awareness. And for this, I think all teachers need to work towards it. So I think we look forward to teachers who can actually make learners aware about it. The teachers for need to adopt all the technologies that are there. They need to be adept with the technology, start using it. And they are in word of mouth, it spreads like anything. So I think awareness building is one area that needs to be focused on. Okay, so the next uh, question is, we have asked this one blockchain, we have asked, the question is, uh, NEP implementation will have effect on other sectors mm -hmm. of education, like mm -hmm. medical education, legal yeah, education, true. technical education. So how do you prepare students uh, for, for this, the technology aspect of it? Okay, so right now if you see the, I mean, um, UGC regulation that has come, it talks about only programs where no lab-based courses are there. There you can go for online. But future mein agar hum jase immersive learning ki baat ki, humne augmented reality, virtual reality ki baat ki, I think for practical-based program, lab-based programs, 
can be also offered online mode. I think we are waiting for a new regulation where which is expected very soon. I think that will open up. So, I think the lot of prob, uh, I mean uh, possibilities are there. Jaise hum medical ke liye kehte, telemedicine ka ek jaise process hai. Right. Same way in fact uh, haptic devices are there. Mm -hmm. Immersive way in fact uh, you have uh, virtual glasses which can be used for uh, analyzing. So I mean technology, I mean lot of research is going on, lot of innovative technologies are coming. At the moment cost is very high but I think in future it will come down and it's quite applicable and especially when we talk about uh, uh, I mean practical ways uh, learning in the labs so we can create complete virtual lab we can have immersive learning all practicals can be conducted online using the all the AR VR tools that we have there are several questions uh, again I repeat very appreciative of the presentation but maybe some ka thoda sa bhav hai we will take one or two questions ek question hai the swam prabha jo channel hai is it available in offline means without internet connectivity yeah so as i mentioned jo abhi wo without internet hi hai abhi hum jo aap participants abhi jo kar rahe hain ye internet based interface mein aake you are getting access but agar aapke paas uh i mean you have uh, i mean the uh, I mean set top box for the DD free to air channels mm -hmm. in fact mm -hmm. you can use that for that purpose so you don't need internet for that yes. so Swam Prabha is available that's why it's being seen as a potential technology which can reach the last mile remotest corner because TV har ghar ghar mein hai almost mm -hmm. so I think that is the advantage of having Swam Prabha so uske liye internet zarurat nahi hai humne jo build kiya aap jo isme abhi platform mein kar rahe to bring in the interactivity so aap tv mein bhi dekhiye but just a chat ke through interact karne ke liye ek platform use kiya but i think future hum ye bhi karenge ki phone in facility dal denge to ekdam hi internet ki zarurat hi nahi hoga so that can be also brought in maybe we'll take the last question and again yes this is a very important question and sabke dimag mein hai abhi kyunki wo ho raha hai and it's one of the disruptive technologies can you just give me one example of ar vr i mean one i mean lot of things the that in india also i have seen happening so you can create a complete classroom so just use in fact uh, we had some demo also you have to take the special goggles that are there you walk through a lab you just you can actually and aaj ke din mein in fact i did not touch on because the nep mein bhi mention nahi hai metaverse ki bhi baat kar rahe hain so technology is going to that level so i think bahut i mean you can create a complete lab chemistry lab hi soch lijiye augmented reality you walk through you feel that there is a lab you have uh, all the i mean i mean solutions and all those things that uh, any experiment that you want to do you can just do it using those goggles you will feel that you are just immersed in that environment and um, as i mentioned about second life very good example mai suggest karungi her teachers go at, have a look into the second life platform apna avatar lijiye just walk in and you are in a virtual class or in a virtual university so all sorts of possibilities are there thank you professor uma uh, maybe we will be just taking a few administrative questions um, your presentation was excellent aur ye hum sab ye keh rahe hain aur professor uma ne bhi shuru mein yahi kaha read the document nep document aur aapko digital technology digital kaise kar sakte hain apne college mein university mein kaise iska istemal kar sakte hain all of you you will learn that so just two three questions jo aap logo ne puche hain ki mcqs jo ab dene hain aapko so mcq questions jo hain those are available on swam platform jahan aapne register kiya hai not on swam prabha so that one gives a clarification kyunki ye to live session hai par aapke swam platform pe ye available hain dusra important point jo hai announcement jo hai wo ye hai ki aaj fir at 4:15 you will be watching the two very important videos one is by professor kasturi rangan and another by professor bhushan patwardhan 
uh, which is also available uh, along with other videos but aaj aaj iska hum special telecast hum iska karenge next question is Uh, again yes available on swam platform there is no separate link which is created so far for the quiz questions mm -hmm. so that we want to make sure and announce to our uh, learners um, and again question is i think you have to just log into swam and you get all the quizzes and everything there itself so you have to get familiarized with the swam platform itself right so the questions it's written ki where are the assignments to isme assignments to nahi hai mcqs hain jo discussion forum ke ke bhi ke pe based hai aur usme term and jisko hum kehte hain us pe bhi based hain aur ye aaj jo tha hamara aakhri live teleconferencing session tha par ye 17 tarikh tak till 17th you can do it after 17th this platform will be i think closed Yeah. so uh, and this batch also will be doing it after 17th uh, based on your quiz results we will be distributing certificates to the teachers so you will be getting on your emails your certificate that we will inform you we each one of you you will be informed by how you will get the certificates so these are the few of the points which we wanted to highlight I hope we hope that all the six lessons live sessions were interesting were educative were informative last request again on uh, behalf of professor uma because she is looking after the technology part of it jo pura sara hua hamara so we thank you for attending these six live sessions go read the document watch the videos do yeah. 31 32 mm -hmm. videos jo uh, uploaded hai platform pe aur jo 14 modules and text modules jo hai read those carefully you will learn you will understand the national education policy 2020 very clearly mm -hmm. and uh, implementation mm -hmm. may be in ko fayda hoga mm -hmm. want to say last word or otherwise Then yeah i think it was a pleasure and we need to see that more and more participants come in and i think you have already enjoyed it and i think it's a learning and you should actually should be our ambassador to take this forward and uh, in fact implementation is very important otherwise nep 2020 will remain as just a document so i think it's important that all gets involved in the process thank you very much Thank you so much stay safe sab namaskar namaskar
Now, uh, before I start with the, the actual presentation of the policy itself, uh, I will spend a few minutes with respect to the relevance of education in the present point. A lot of things have been asked to me in public with respect to why at this time an educational policy, what kind of relevance does it have in the context of India and the context of the global uh, developments. And always you have to articulate some aspects of it. Of course, first we all recognize there's more than three decades since we had the last one, and there are several developments that have happened. India, of course, will have the highest population of young people in the world over the next decade. And we recognize that nearly 50% of the population will be below 35 years of age, aspiring for high quality education. This democratic dividend certainly has to be taken advantage of. I don't think we have discussed it in several platforms. We have debated it, and uh, certainly this is a direction and aspiration for the country which we have to realize. Globalization and demands of a knowledge economy and knowledge society call for emphasis on the need for acquisition of new skills by learners on a regular basis for them to learn how to learn and become lifelong learners, a critical consideration to be addressed appropriately. And that is where this education policy certainly has focused on. Changes in knowledge landscape, especially science and technology, I'm going to have to say here, would advance in big data analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence, all demand skilled workforce involving mathematics, computer sciences, data science, as well as multidisciplinary abilities across the sciences, social sciences, and humanities. The education of future need to be reconfigured in order to meet the goals of the global education development agenda. We are a part of that. The goal four of the sustainable development goals four of 2030 that seeks to ensure inclusion and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning uh, for opportunities for all. So this is broadly just to give it kind of a flavor of the kind of consideration probably the, the people who matter in terms of defining when to come out with a policy uh, got, thought about. Uh, now, how did we go about? Uh, a little bit of that also is of interest for, for the audience here. The process, of course, was that we had the members of the policy committee with the government set it up, and then we had a members of a drafting committee. We thought that besides the policy framing, we also need to bring it up in a way in which it can be presented. We had a special draft, drafting committee. It had members of the draft, policy committee also. And then we had a set of members, experts, who provided a kind of a technical, a technical secretary of support for doing this and not to be satisfied with it. This is where I have my own strong views, uh, the question of being independently evaluated with respect to the type of presentation we are making, ideas that we have created and the strategy we have uh, crafted. Uh, we put certain peer reviewers, people who are away from the policy formulation who are very well aware of the kind of educational system, the academic system this country uh, over the years, and uh, therefore competent enough to give us very vital inputs about the first level of drafting this policy. So there were peer reviewers here. The discussions and consultation, we, did, we, we went through a very, even though this particular policy was initially having a basis of previous policy document back four years of work at, very intense work had gone through in the formulation of this policy earlier itself. Documentation from ground work consultations were there, submissions from individuals and groups were there. So there was the previous Honorable Minister of Education. Uh, we had also the TSR Subramaniam Committee and many others. So we had many things to fall back on. The question was to review them, to adopt them and to see where we need to move extra, extra efforts. And that is where we saw that discussions and consultations with the different stakeholders, including organizations, institutions, and individuals. Uh, we had quite a number of inputs which were new, which had very unique in terms of things which were not earlier presented or considered for discussion. And of course, when everything was ready and when we made an initial presentation uh, to the ministry, uh, they felt that ultimately to go into the public domain is a national, a very important national document. We need to get the public responses of what they are in for, for the future of education. Uh, we got more than two and a half lakh responses from both in the, from the school and the uh, college education, higher education point of view. So that was another major thing. We went through a consultation with the state educational authorities, including in many of the states, we had also consultation with the state ministers. 
and then we had a review so that when the policy was in the near final stages the number of reviews were con conducted by the honorable prime minister himself in fact he went through every aspect of the policy and every items of the policy and he wanted to make sure that there is a level of pragmatism and the ability to carry this forward in the implementation domain. So this is one of the important things that the Honorable Prime Minister did. He came out with several interesting suggestions also, I should mention. So that is the other part of it. And finally, we got the cabinet approval on the 29th of July, 2020. Immediately following that, for a number of measures, the first and foremost was to make sure that there is a very intense familiarization process uh, for this. So major conferences with chancellors, vice chancellors, directors of higher education institutions, other high-level functionaries convoyed, are convoyed. These are meetings convened by UGC and Ministry of Education and addressed by the Honorable Prime Minister and His Excellency, the President of India. So these were kind of things that were also carried. This also underscored the importance at the highest level that they attach to the policy. And now we are in the stages, and I will say at the end of my talk, a little bit about how, we, how the concerned agencies and the ministry is moving towards the implementation. Now, to just give a framework for the policy, the policy provides an integrated and flexible approach to education. It has kept the interconnectedness, the various phases of education in mind, and how the same will enable continuity, coherence, and processes to ultimately realize an end-to-end -end educational map, uh, roadmap for the country an articulation of a broad view of education encompassing the holistic development with special emphasis on kindling of the creative potential of each individual in its richness and complexity has grown increasingly popular in the recent years several domains of discussions the policy thus aims to have it aims at the development of the 21st century skills. I don't have to re-emphasize what the 21st century skills are here for the students while giving through, giving them the flexibility, making choices consistent uh, with the dynamics of a knowledge society. Before we go high, straight into the higher education and go into the details of the same, a little bit about the connection between the school education and the higher education. We do recognize all of us and the policy does so. Uh, the interconnectedness of the various phases of education. I mentioned it earlier. School education is of intrinsic importance. There's no question. How a student experiences the schooling phase of education could have a significant influence on those subsequently pursue higher education, including professional and vocational, besides, of course, helping to lay the foundation uh, for lifelong learning. So keeping this in mind, I'm trying to first put the overall policy element, the element that is gone into the policy uh, as a part of the academic side, and not just one of the governors and other areas. We have the early childhood care and education, home education, and gun bodies and preschools. Uh, one of the very key elements, because we did make transformatory recommendations in the context of the early school education. I will say a few words about it in the subsequent projection. The found, and right now it is divided over a 15 year period of foundational, preparatory, middle and secondary. We'll see the details of that. On the higher side, of course, we have the undergraduate, general education, teacher education, professional and vocational to focus a little bit. And then we have the postgraduate, masters and PhD, not to be, not, need not be emphasized here. And ultimately a national research foundation, a unique institution that will spur the research and particularly in the educational institution and university system particularly. And then, of course, we have areas like lifelong learning, adult education, and many other areas that have been also including the use of technology for education. These are all part and parcel. So this is just the broad elements of the policy uh, which you have touched upon in the policy. And I will, of course, as requested, I will try to concentrate on the higher education, but not before saying a few words about the kind of things that we have thought about in bringing the school education uh, to a new domain. The extent 10 plus 2 structure is what the early school education will be. It will be modified with a new pedagogical and curricular restructuring of 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 covering the ages 3 to 18. The, 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 we have shown it here in terms of four levels. The, the foundational level where the policy, the, this is the, the education starts unlike at 6 years. Now it starts at 3 years. 3 to 8 years is what we characterize. The first five years as the foundational 
phase of the education, school education, three years of pre-primary, preschool, and then we have a primary education, which is first and second class, the grades. So you have the five years here. What is important in this phase, which will take you up to the age of eight, is the fact that the policy recognizes the individual differences in the cognitive development of children at this stage, and therefore formal structured learning will be absent during these five years. So the important thing is that each child has to be evaluated with respect to its growth uh, of the brain. And these are not uniform, so there is no linear pattern in which the, the growth occurs. And it's also important that 85% of the brain virtually is matured by the age of eight. So we need to make sure that the learning process is suitably adopted that maximal advantage of this kind of a pattern by 85% by the age of eight is whether it is language learning, whether it is literacy and numeracy, these are all critical elements in this phase of the uh, foundational phase of the school education. This you carry forward a little more from unstructured, you go into the curricular structure in the next three years, that is from age eight to age 11, where the curricular structure and standardization can be slowly introduced. And taking, carrying this forward for the next three years, uh, you virtually go into sub subject areas. You have a teacher children uh, student interaction much more effectively, and also have the capacity for abstraction because that is something which was the earlier two phases much less because of the nature of the brain growth. And lastly, we have the secondary education, the last four years of school education, ages 14 to 18. There will be multidisciplinary orientation with exit options. This is a phase that will prepare the student for undergraduate program. And that's why I'm coming to this because undergraduate program is very much related to the kind of orientation in the policy that we have tried to create in the secondary level of the school education, including early introduction of liberal arts education. So this is the kind of a thing. Of course, you have a special education here. You have the exit option here. If you want to leave at the age of 18, the school education and take up some kind of a job. There are enough provisions for that, enough training and other kinds of things. In fact, we have recommended that we need to have a youngster who knows at least one vocational area thoroughly, 100% in the time we leave the school, that kind of a thing. And the first four elements of the vocational education and the overall the scheme uh, is a part of the secondary and part of the middle, middle as well as the secondary education. So this is the broad thing. Uh, I thought I wanted to emphasize this mainly because these are the times in the we understand today the neural sciences and the kind of cognitive science which dictated this study of uh, creating a policy around the present understanding of the brain and its growth. And I thought I should bring it to the attention of this erudite audience. And this is just to give you an idea of a brain, how critical it is to make sure that we make use of the, the, the brain and its, and its stimulation, the early phase of the child's growth. And one can see very clearly the cognitive stimulation, what it does to the brain, uh, to a case where we did such a simulation has not occurred, we can very clearly see the temporal lobes, how different they are in terms of its uh, uh, growth and maturity. And which essentially means the how much you take advantage of the pattern of the grain growth in terms of the learning process uh, and also the teaching process. Now, having said all this with respect to the school education, we move over to the um, undergraduate education, part of the higher education. What the policy does is to promote a holistic. We have made a broader approach, which is holistic and multidisciplinary at the undergraduate level. And this is something which is not new to this audience. And especially, I don't know, IIT Delhi is some of the very early efforts in the context of holistic and multidisciplinary education. Uh, they generate more imagination and creativity in the student to ensure their all rounded development. And of course, the concept which we today turn as a liberal education, which is really multidisciplinary and holistic, is an age old idea in the Indian context. Uh, I don't have to say this again, the Banabata's Kadambari which is considered a person was recognized as truly educated when he mastered the 64 colors encompassing music, dance, painting, culture, languages, and in addition to subjects such as science, engineering, and mathematics, as well as vocational subjects. Liberal education explores the remarkable relationships that exist among the sciences and humanities, mathematics and arts, medicine and physics, etc., and more generally, 
the surprising unity of all fields of human endeavor. A comprehensive liberal education develops all capacities of human beings, intellectual, aesthetics, social, physical, emotional, and moral uh, in an integrated manner. So this is the approach, and this is the one we have tried to translate in the policy as a crucial step to lead India into the 21st century. The fourth industrial revolution, multidisciplinary education is central. Even engineering schools, I, I know IIT is following this. In this case, will move towards more holistic multidisciplinary education with more arts and humanities. Well, arts and humanities students will have to learn to aim more science, while all will try to make an effort to incorporate more vocational subjects and soft skills. India's rich legacy, I mentioned about Barnabata's work and many other kind of work subsequently in the arts as well as in sciences and beyond will significantly help in making the move towards such an education, hopefully an easy and natural transition. Now, how is it that the policy has put that in the concrete terms? Liberal education with broad multidisciplinary explanation, it has to be an imaginative and flexible curricular structure. Creative combinations of disciplines of study, this has to be chosen, whether it's arts, crafts, um, sciences, mathematics, one has to see the, how do you create a you know, creative combination, this has to be all worked out. And multiple exit and entry option is another important feature of the undergraduate education. And masters and doctoral education will provide the sub based specialization as a part of the higher education. The three to four year undergraduate zone with multiple exit options. The four year program is the main recommendation in terms of the undergraduate program. Undergraduate degree will encompass, of course, liberal arts, or multidisciplinary and holistic education. And then you have the chosen major and minor concept that is there. We have the vocational subjects, and later on, even professional education will be brought into this kind of an undergraduate education, which is a four year. The three year program, which is currently very much there, will be retained with the necessary changes to bring in more holisticity and interdisciplinarity. Both the three and four year programs lead to a degree with honors with research work. So that is another thing that happened. So there is a provision for research work in the, the, the undergraduate program, uh, which prepare on one side, it really enriches the uh, youngster on the other side. We certainly have a better preparation for the higher education and ultimately exit is provision does exist with a two year diploma in the uh, with a two year diploma at the end of two years of undergraduate and a one year certificate at the end of the first year of the undergraduate education. These are all drawn in a way in which there is enough provision for the person when he exits, uh, he will have an appropriate kind of a professional career which can be chosen. And this is a preparation that you try to do in the first year and second year of the undergraduate education. With the proviso that in case in the later years you want to come back to the education with certain provisions with respect to the preparatory part of the uh, entry, uh, you can still continue your education to a third year or a fourth year or even higher education part of the postgraduate education. This is also kept as a flexibility in the system. On the master side, two years for those with a three-year undergraduate degree, one year with for those with a four-year undergraduate degree with honors. And an integrated five year program is the three kind of flexible way in which you can go towards uh, master education. Next one I would like to bring is the integrated <clears throat> professional education. Uh, regarding the integration of professional education with general education, the policy aims to take a holistic view to the preparation of professionals by ensuring broad-based competencies and understanding of the social human context, a strong ethical compass in and addition to the highest quality professional capacities. There is something holistic about the recommendation that we have made. I'm sure most of the professionals are very aware of this particular part of it, especially the IIT faculty and the academics. And, uh, but we have made a strong pitch for this because we think many of the higher education institutions, especially the university system, certainly need to address this much more seriously than what has been done so far. All institution offering either professional or general education must be organically evolved into a multidisciplinary institution offering both by 2030. 
the overall higher education sector will aim to be an integrated higher education system, including professional and vocational education. Thus, this approach will be applicable to all higher education institutions across the current streams, which will eventually merge into one coherent ecosystem of higher education. This is ultimately the objective by 2030, 2035. There is certainly a time frame. It's not easy to make this kind of transformation, but we think that we need an integrated professional education as a part of an overall higher education. Now we come to the quality higher academic uh, research in the fields. I can, I don't have to carry coal to Newcastle by giving you why we should do research, but uh, put some numbers here just to see that the situation in our country with respect to research, whereas IITs and those Kaisers and things like that, you have uh, tremendous uh, research and vibrant activity going along with teaching. The broader question of the university systems, both state and the central, we, I think we need to do quite a lot. Even though we do address this question of equality academic research in the overall context of higher education institution, we would like to particularly make this policy focused on educational systems in the university and many of the state universities and other private and some of the other private universities certainly has to review this in the context of the type of recommendation we made. And uh, we, we do know the importance of the European Union <laughs> estimate that two thirds of the economic growth of uh, Europe during they came the research. You, you had also, you know, if you really look at the European accomplishments in the research and innovation, I was just trying to look at some of the details. 15% of all productivity gains in 2013, and that an annual increase of 0.2% of GDP in R&D investment result in an annual increase of 1.1% in GDP, a five-fold return for the type of outcome that they were getting. If you look at the present research and innovation investment in our case, 0.7 point, we can keep debating on that. Uh, one has to compare it with respect to something like 2.8 in US or 4.3 in Israel or South Korea. Uh, these are the kind of which are three times the proportion of GDP. And this low level of investment certainly meant that number of researchers in India per lack of population is just 15. Your numbers are 400, 800 kind of numbers. If you talk of US and as, as an example, other internal impact, I don't have to again emphasize low levels of patent application and scientific publication. So these are the kind of thing. And uh, certainly it was a very important agenda in the inner discussion with regard to propagating research in the higher educational institutions. And so we have spent a considerable space and time to make sure that we have some very tangible recommendations on promoting this. Now, how have we tried to recommend it? We have tried to recommend the creation of a national research foundation. It is, put the, it is based on the fact that the policy will put emphasis on catalyzing and energizing research and innovation across the country in all academic disciplines with particular focus on the state universities and colleges. I said that in the beginning, and that is where really the lacuna does exist, and they are serious that too. A fund to seed research in all universities and colleges, so that synergies between the research and quality education can be leveraged maximally. NRF will fund across all disciplines, it's not only in engineering, and also it will expand the research and innovation at all universities and colleges, including private institutions. Uh, we have not made a distinction between private institutions and public institu public funded institutions. And the criterion will be, of course, the merit of the proposal and the kind of capability to do research and the type of outcomes. And we need to make sure that they get the benefit of a funding system where uh, this can be pushed further. Uh, after all, they also educate Indians and many other people depend on the private institutions for education. The NRA will have the provision to many themes, science, technology, social sciences, arts, humanities, and many more. In the scope, of course, everybody understands funding research through a competitive peer review process, building research capacity at academic institutions across the country through mentorship. There are very specific recommendations we have made regarding the mentorship, the type of bringing in 
people with who are veterans of research who are at, the, at this time available for guiding research in these kind of institutions who can spend some time doing research guiding research uh, and also establishing uh, the capability to conduct research uh, in these kind of institutions and then create the beneficial engages between the researchers academy everybody talks about this and disseminating research through seminars which is the other aspect of uh, doing research so these are the kind of things this is just to give a little brief summary a snapshot of the kind of thought that we are put into the national research foundation we think this needs to be established and this is also going to be we had of course in our mind uh, it's like the national research foundation of usa there are models of establishing this kind of a system uh, which has which, which really becomes uh, a place where they address the excellence the relevance and the kind of outcomes uh, with respect to research and this has had a very strong influence uh, on the support of research in the educational systems in many of the advanced countries and particularly if you look at the models like us and europe and the other aspect that we have addressed is question of the energized and educational capable faculty we have done we have spent uh, uh, devoted considerable space with regard to the questions of the faculty uh, quality and engagement of its faculty and uh, virtually we can say the faculty is put back at the heart of the higher education the rampant practice of contractual appointment one issue very heavy teaching loads these are all may not be applicable to institutions like iits but this is these are anyway i don't have to emphasize these aspects of it with respect to the broader issue of higher education the infrastructure support most faculty do not even have a structure faculty recruitment and development plan so we have gone into the details areas like recruitment development plan career proposal pro progression compensation management every part of the institutional development plan should carry this in the higher education appropriately designed a permanent employment tenure track system for the thing in by 2030 autonomous faculty empowered to make curricular choices conduct assessment of students infrastructure for continuous professional development these are other aspects of it and appropriately designed bridge courses for mid-career professionals uh, to get into teaching uh, that's also available so that if anybody wants to get into the teaching profession uh, from another area where you need to facilitate this by the appropriate bridge courses that can be you know, worked out the one of the important things that we have tried to do is to consider the school education and the teachers for the school education one thing we found that the existing system the school education does in time meet the type of standards and the type of things that we need to have as a background for teaching at the school level uh, by the conventional educational system uh, providing teacher education what we have tried to do is to move the school education preparation will be done in the multidisciplinary university departments of education will be set up in many universities to offer a four-year integrated state specific BED. the whole idea is to bring in BED as one more of those undergraduate educational uh, stream uh, one of the undergraduate educational stream put it at a par with the other professional educational themes as well as the mainstream education so BED will be an undergraduate program of study covering both disciplinary and pedagogic teacher preparation courses for each stage of education foundational to secondary all subjects including arts sports vocational education they will be mainstream on par with other undergraduate degrees gradually the four-year program will be eligible for masters and phd programs and the current two-year bed program will continue till 2030 but that after 2030 only those institutions who are capable or who are qualified to provide a four-year teacher education can offer the two-year teacher education so we want to make sure that the standard the quality and the excellence that is intrinsic to defining the teacher education and preparation certainly it takes into account through the higher education uh, systems overseeing the teacher preparation and education two-year program will be used for lateral entry of school teachers there are also many interests in the lead you know, people becoming school teachers in the la in the lateral mode specifically designed courses in the pedagogy for mid-career professionals to become faculty will also be introduced and i don't have to say substandard and dysfunctional uh, teacher education you know thousands of them have been already shut down and this need to, this is recommended to be reviewed either they move towards um, the institutions like the degree giving autonomous colleges 
or they close down or move over to other areas where the teacher education is not the main focus for these institutions. Something on the educational technology, Professor Ram Babal mentioned about this with respect to the Prime Minister's this thing. We have addressed the questions of integrating technology at all levels of education. There is a very specific section where we have discussed this. I don't think I need to go much into the details of this. Again, the questions of four broad categories, the well-known improving teaching, learning, innovation, and supporting teacher preparation, continuous teacher professional development, enhancing educational access to disadvantaged groups, streamlining educational planning, administration, and management, and teacher training for trade, the edutech is critical. And towards this, I also bring in some uh, uh, example uh, where improving teaching, learning, and evaluation as a part of uh, the educational systems resilience during the recent crisis like the COVID-19, the online education, synchronous mode, live interactions, and asynchronous mode, blending high-quality pre-recorded content uh, rapid feedback with automated smart evaluation. So these are the kind of things on the improving the teaching and learning and education. Example regarding the supporting the teacher education and continuous teacher professional development. You have the recommender systems for content and certifications. Just another example in the COVID-19 scenario. The enhancing educational access to advise one day's group. Connect the few specialized teachers to virtual classrooms of learners with specific needs. Must, advant, must address the digital divide. That is the biggest problem with respect to the implementation of some of the, the digital divide. And certainly this is uh, to be seen. Now, streamlining education, planning, ed administration, and management. We are also trying to set up as a part of this a national repository. There is a, there is a national repository of educational data to track progress in achieving educational goals. So this is just to give you a gist of the kind of thing that we have gone into details uh, in the policy on the questions of educational introduction. But uh, equally important is the fact we have tried to create a kind of a, a setup. Uh, it is not any um, a, a, a creating a lab or it's not creating a facility, but it's a kind of a forum a national educational technology forum uh, which we have recommended to be set up with the following rules to provide in the, the reason why we thought about this kind of a body uh, in the context of choices in the context of selection in the context of a research in educational technology in the context of adoption of educational technology from other sources of technology the reason why I thought is the the moment you throw open an edu technology as a facilitator for a certain type of function, whether it is related to education or many other areas, it could be even to deal with uh, energy from the waste. But the type of technology and the type of options that that will be available are enormous, and most of the time, the ability to make choices is one of the biggest problems that we see. Uh, the questions of when ISRO did work related to a national. Um, yeah, 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 what you may call as a developmental program where you wanted to bring educational information to remote areas. The choice was to make sure that we create educational material. But what were the materials? Those materials had to be researched whether it is appropriate for the tribal population is going to receive, receive the material. The two to three years of research work was needed before you could decide what the educational material and the technique of reaching the local population will receive those ideas and they will get and read themselves in the process. This is a major challenge. This is one of the kind of example that if you want to proliferate the technology, you need to have a means of studying it, understand, evaluate, and regulate it. That is the idea that National Educational Technology Forum that we have tried to set up to provide an independent evidence-based as, as advice to state and governments on adoption of technology-based interventions to build intellectual and institutional capacities in educational technology, to envision strategic trust in areas of technology domain and to promote education in them among educational institutions, and to articulate new directions of research and innovation, the use of technology for improving education. We would assume that these kind of things also the actual activities on research and things will be carried out by the Department of Education which will come up in the higher education institution, at least some of the higher educational institution. 
So the National Education Technology Forum will maintain a regular inflow of authentic data from multiple sources, including the educational technology innovators and practitioners, particularly at the grassroots level. Disruptive technology, you don't need, this, is, this is something you're very much uh, day to day, you're seized with. The 1986-1992 policy could not expect the internet's disruption. This policy fully expects the educational system to face many technological disruptions, artificial intelligence, machine, machine learning, and so on. Two major aspects related to such disruptive technology we have identified, harnessing technology to improve educational outcome, that is human plus artificial intelligence, hybrid interactive systems, education in new and disruptive technologies, identifying them and preparing students in new large numbers. And finally, the project addresses both these kind of a thing, the policy. Now, on the governor's side, I have just tried to, again, the, we got the policy in the beginning of my talk. I'm just coming back to the policy side and uh, what is the kind of a governance structure that has been done. Uh, I am trying to here show the, the state, state education and the central education in two to color codings. The, the blue is the color code for higher education and the yellow is the color code for this. And the main thing is the central agency for the, the, the education, the CABE, which is currently there, a council of uh, the educational uh, the thing. Uh, I, I, the, the, this uh, particular CABE, um, the Central Advisory Board of Education, uh, is now in this policy, they have elevated uh, to the level that they will oversee the overall administration, governance, and evaluation of how the policy is going to work at the from the central level and also to make fine tuning or midterm corrections if needed and virtually becomes a kind of a a, a kind of a, a evaluate a reviewer and evaluator and also a recommender with respect to the changes needed in the context of higher education so this is the system which is adopting the central advisory board and making it more empowered then we have an higher educational commission of india which is what is recommended to be set it up as the highest body on the uh, higher educational commissions as a part of the governors you have the four major verticals that are there under the hcci one is the academic and standard setting which can be the peer the professional standard setting bodies and so on of that g is the general education council the national council of technical education the all india council of technical the medical ultimately they will all come under the PS, the professional standard setting bodies under the academic and standard setting. And on the academic side, you have, of course, the national higher energy qualification framework for higher education. And then you have the second one, which is regulation, the national higher educational regulatory, uh, regulatory body. And then you have accreditation, national accreditation, this the council. Then you have the funding higher educational uh, grants council. So these are the four verticals under a higher educational uh, commission of India. This is what is recommended. And of course, the education provision will continue to be given by the autonomous institution and other types of institutions, which are a part of the higher education or school education. So this is the kind of a structure, broad structure that we have tried to evolve with respect to the governance of the educational system and with uh, this clear delineation of the higher education part of it. Uh, important about this is the fact that empowered governance and autonomy of higher education. Uh, this is something which I, I don't think that this need to be much discussed in a place like IIT or IAC, but it's good to know that we have, this is one of the things that has can't be enough concerned while they were debating on the subject uh, with several of the experts in this area. The recognizes the effective governance and leadership is the key to creation of a culture of excellence in the innovation of higher educational institution. All the higher educational institution in the next 15 years will become autonomous self-governing entities through a system of graded accreditation or graded autonomy. With appropriate graded accreditation, such institutions shall establish a board of governors consisting of highly qualified and competent individuals with proven capabilities and a strong sense of commitment, something which we need to do for many of the higher education institutions in this country. 
the board of governors will be empowered to govern the institution free of any external interference something everybody talks about it this is something very explicitly made clear in the policy make all appointments including that of the head of the institution and take all decisions regarding the governors the board of governors will be responsible and accountable to the stakeholders through transparent self disclosures of the relevant thing the board of governors to develop a strategic institutional development these are all there in many of the institutions long term medium term 5 years or short term 1 to 3 years based on the institution can develop educational and research outcome parameters for quality and capacity improve organizational and financial and human resource development plan to assess the progress so this is just to give you a flavor of what we have recommended uh, in the empowered governors and autonomy of the higher education so the most important aspect is the fact that we have strongly recommended the autonomy um on the governors on the academics as also on the finances now what is the kind of way forward before i conclude uh, the thing there are several things i did mention in the beginning of my talk that uh, there, there has been one of the most important step that was taken immediately after the government you know took decision on accepting this recommendation the necessary inputs from public domain and other sources is the fact that once they knew that there were a number of presentation there were a number of discussions or a number of seminars and other kinds of interactive system and uh, both uh, honorable prime minister and honorable president were involved in many of these i don't have to say that here many of you were there as a part of that particular thing so there is quite a lot that has happened in terms of sensitizing the policy in its row but certainly there are many things uh, which continue to be inquired about uh, a seek clarification about and uh, not every some of them will come forward only when you try to do these things uh, you start getting a feel of the issues and that is where i said about the uh, mid, mid term correction or fine tuning or better clarification or change of strategy this will be a part and parcel of this but by and large i find that this is understood by many of the policy makers and implementation um the related responsible people uh, the moe itself has done an action plan now they have done it i understand you know they have because i am telling this both this part of it more from the input that i received rather than trying to be a part of it but i i want to say that the moe has uh, certainly provided a good action plan which they have worked it out which has got something like 100 and out they have taken the higher education policy section they have looked at the the uh, various policy uh, items they have converted them into identified action plans and 181 activities have been identified with the time of frame frame that it needs to do this under 16 broad themes this is what they have tried to do uh, we need to do this we have, there is a continuous churning of these ideas and some discussions are going on on this the ugc on its own has been also con con um, organizing Uh, conclaves uh, for discussions on this particular thing, and uh, then there have been a lot of uh, the outreach of the policy to different segments of the uh, the, the 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 governor systems of the country, uh, both the central and the uh, state has been another major feature of the recent uh, efforts uh, in trying to make sure that the policy is un read, understood, and. Uh, then come out with a suitable strategies of implementation which are applicable because there are the local issues also one has to keep it in mind there is a broad strategy that we need to have for the country for the policy to be translated into the next step of implementation and also specifics with respect to the local conditions or the regional conditions and things of that kind which is more than just uh, the policy it's, it has got finances it has got resources human resources and many other things <clears throat> so this is and something on which work will be done but the fact uh, i would like to emphasize is and you know this again because you are a part of a system which is implementing it you know, that uh, this work is in the forward in the movement and i cannot but conclude with the statement that uh, as i said in the beginning i think this is a very unique policy it has its own challenges to implement but i think what is important and what is reassuring for some of us is the fact that 
many elements of this has been done in some form or other by institutions. And I mentioned about the IIT Delhi because of its pioneering role in areas like uh, the multidisciplinarity and approach of science, technology, and policy, society, or more, more recently with respect to humanity and social sciences to be integrated into the undergraduate education. So these are things on which it is not that these are all totally new because of the policy, but there is much more uh, that, that, that has been done in, through the various actions and directions and visions of various leaders and institutions of this country. I am, I'm sure that we need to understand it very clearly. We need to see how that can be adopted and how this policy itself can aid in taking it forward. So with these few words, I would like to thank again the Institute, the Director, Deputy Director and others for this privilege of talking to you and sharing my thoughts with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ignu, for inviting me uh, to this lecture series. Uh, I uh, will talk to you today about the uh, National Education Policy 2020, and especially its focus on the uh, academic uh, research quality. You know. If you look at the section 18 uh, in NEP 2020, uh, it talks about catalyzing quality academic research uh, through a new national research foundation. You know. So NRF, is something what NEP is proposing. And I must tell you that uh, uh, NEP is one of the most uh, uh, transformational policy that we are getting after a very, very long time, after over three decades, this policy has come. And uh, the genuine focus on the uh, Indian uh, knowledge systems and research uh, is very important. I'll touch upon some of these uh, uh, subjects uh, during my a talk of about 30 minutes, you know. As all of us know, uh, we have a long historical tradition of research and knowledge creation, especially in science, technology, humanities, art and literature, medicine and agriculture. And we can go on naming several scholars uh, from ancient India, uh, you know, uh, not only the inventor of zero, but the Kanad, who also talked about uh, the basics of physics and uh, uh, the Aryabhat, our Amira, and uh, Chanakya, Panini, and uh, Patanjali, Charak, Sushrut, the list is very long. So the research and innovation tradition was there in Bharat, I would say, because when we talk about India, we start thinking about India only after uh, 1947. But we have a history of thousands of years. You know? So Bharat and Bharatiya Gyan Parampara is something uh, which we have to really consider at the backdrop when we are talking about uh, research in 21st century. Uh, there is no doubt that uh, India uh, or Bharat actually, uh, uh, and that's why Prime Minister has uh, appealed us for Atmanirbhar Bharat. And Atmanirbhar Bharat, uh, we have to also uh, regain Atma Sanman. And regaining Atma Sanman uh, for Atmanirbhar Bharat requires uh, to learn from our heritage, our culture, our tradition, and take them forward with the current science and technology for innovation. Uh, so we need to really reclaim our tradition uh, to emerge as a knowledge society and also emerge as a stronger economy in the world. Because without research and innovation, this is not possible. A significant expansion of our research capacities and output across disciplines is very, very vital. For instance, if I may just quote, which is there in uh, NEP 2020, uh, it says that, or it uh, rather gives some figures, you know, 
the research and innovation investment in India has been very, very small. Uh, for instance, just 0.69% of the GDP. And if you compare with uh, the other countries, example, uh, United States is about 2.8%, China is about 2.1%, Israel is about 4.3%, South Korea, a smaller country, a much smaller country, uh, is spending something like 4.2%, almost three to four times more than what we are spending. So the uh, establishment of National Research Foundation comes uh, as a very uh, prominent hope uh, to move in the right direction uh, because the overarching goal of NRF is to enable a culture of research uh, to permeate through our uh, universities because the culture of research has to permeate through our universities, especially uh, the state universities and public institutions where research capability is currently limited. You know. And we have to provide a very reliable base of merit-based, at the same time, equitable peer review research funding you know, uh, to help develop this kind of a research culture in our institutions. If you look at the research output and its impact, and if you take a, a kind of a, a span overview uh, from 1996 to 2010 as the first step, you know, and if you take a data from Web of Science or Scopus, uh, these are the most reputed search engines, you know, you will find that uh, India trails behind. You know, in India uh, trails behind even uh, of smaller countries like Japan or uh, United Kingdom or Germany. US, of course, is one of the top in the list, but uh, India uh, still trails even behind China. India is trailing behind China. And this is something uh, which uh, we have to work on very, very seriously. Uh, I am a biomedical research scientist, you know, and therefore my talk, I will be taking examples from biomedical research, you know. But while I take examples of biomedical research, uh, what I'm telling you is true to many other disciplines as well. For instance, if you take, uh, compare uh, countries like say, uh, India, America, China, and Germany, and uh, biomedical research output, if you get data, which we call it as cytometric data uh, from this scopus, still you will find that uh, India uh, trails uh, behind. And uh, while during last decade, I would say that the efforts from Indian scientific community are showing now internationally and therefore our position is becoming stronger and stronger, still we have a long way to go. Uh, while we talk about research now, I will say something about uh, uh, what is the current status. You know, if I if I take example of biomedical research, you know, let me tell you that somehow uh, in our country at least, you know, the research has been going on uh, more uh, on the uh, uh, lines of routine, if I may say so, because there is a very less component of originality and innovation. For example, in medical sciences, if you look at, you know, what kind of uh, original contributions have come from medical sciences from India? If we add this question, you know, we have to really search very hard. For instance, uh, new molecules, new drugs, how many of them have come from India? Uh, the number may be very, very small as compared to uh, many other countries, you know. So uh, this, at the same time, if we look at the potential and knowledge which we have is enormous. But somehow there is disconnect. We are looking at our own heritage just to take pride, you know, uh, and uh, taking pride uh, in past glory is important, but we should not really uh, become uh, uh, kind of a, uh, sitting back and we just saying that when somebody else invents something, you know, we knew it and it is there in our old text. We should use our ancient knowledge as a knowledge resource and build on that new research, innovative research, and move on and show the world that this is what uh, uh, Bharatiya Gyan Parampara had, which world did not know. And now we are coming out with the new science and technology. In medicine, for instance, you know, the plastic surgery, all of us know, is documented uh, in Indian uh, uh, subcontinent. Even during British period, there has been systematic documentation when the uh, community of Kumars used to do this plastic surgery uh, very, very efficiently, especially the uh, transplantation of nose, because during olden period, you know, cutting of chopping of nose was considered as the dehumiliating punishment uh, that was given uh, at that time. So nose uh, 
uh, transplantation or implantation was very, very uh, necessary. So there is a detailed process which is given. Uh, so we don't have to go back to Sushrut period. Of course, Sushrut is considered to be one of the uh, pioneers or founders of surgery, of modern surgery in India. So I can give you more and more such uh, examples, but let's uh, look at what is happening in modern science today, globally. Uh, one of the most reputed journal, uh, all of you may have heard is Lancet. You know, it's one of the most reputed biomedical journal and Lancet came out with a series. And in that series, one of the most reputed scientists uh, from Stanford, his name is John Ioannidis, you know, and he published a series of articles and in which he showed that 85% of the research that goes in biomedical research is wasted, actually. That means it is of no use. Research, if it is not going to be useful for people, what kind of research we are doing? You know, research just for sake of research is not going to be beneficial for our country, especially. We have to invest in research, which will be practically useful and get back to something to the society. So this kind of a wastage in research is happening because of several reasons. Primarily, we don't ask right questions, you know, asking the right research question is the first step, which we don't invest much time in that. Uh, most of our studies or many of our studies may be badly designed uh, and therefore they are not publishable or reported properly in uh, the reputed journals, you know. So I would say that creativity and scientific research should be for search of truth, creating new body of knowledge. And it is about pleasure. We should take pleasure in doing research. It should be about our devotion, your, our own commitment and never ending quest for innovation. You know? And research should not be used merely for the purpose of publications. It is not some kind of a race. I have to become uh, uh, from associate professor to uh, professor. Therefore, I have to publish. It is. It, it, it should not be converted into some kind of a desperation uh, to publish, which we witness today. Because today research is more is happening because I want to do PAD because PAD will open me doors for getting job in the universities or academic institution. Or we do research to get recognition. In my uh, name, uh, name prefix, doctor will come and I will get more uh, recognition in the society. You know, These are not the reasons for doing research. Uh, socioeconomic benefits, uh, obviously as expected, from research, but they should be natural outcomes. The first purpose of research should be in search of truth and creating new body of knowledge. You know. But somehow what happened is during uh, last, uh, especially three, four decades, you know, slowly uh, the uh, erosion uh, in terms of what I would like to call it academic integrity was very, very visible uh, in our country. You know, and especially it was more visible uh, during the uh, last two decades, you know, and uh, I will just uh, uh, talk about some of these cases. You know. uh, so I will also discuss some of the plagiarism uh, incidences which happened in India, and all this actually tarnishes image of our country. And therefore, I'm uh, stressing more uh, on academic integrity uh, and uh, publication ethics uh, and uh, uh, the issues related to plagiarism uh, in our country. I come from Pune University. So I remember while I was at Pune University in 1992 to 1994, you know, uh, one of the most uh, debated uh, case of plagiarism uh, was un uh, unearthed. And that case in court went on up to 2018, finally, when High Court gave a verdict and the two senior professors were actually uh, sacked from their service. Senior professors were sacked from their service. In 1996, another uh, uh, case happened in the same university, you know, and this is just I'm giving you a few examples, but in every university, you will find that such cases uh, exist, you know, and uh, uh, if you really take, uh, go deep into why this is happening and why people become so desperate to publish, why people tend to take shortcuts, uh, unfortunately, I must mention that the root cause of that goes in regulation. And uh, uh, while uh, I am saying that, I, I'm also give, going to give you some examples. For instance, you know, uh, and all these regulations, I must tell you that were made with good intentions, you know, but uh, somehow people try to misuse them, you know, and try to find shortcuts. For, for first, uh, I will give an example of UGC regulation 
while i was at ugc we have discussed this thoroughly and therefore i am frankly sharing with you ugc regulation 2010 which talked about api you know academic performance indicators you know they gave a certain amount of weightage to national publications international publications etc national conferences international pub so there is nothing like international uh, publication or national publication or international journal or national journal you know journals are based on the quality of journal not whether they are national or international for example current science although published in india is an international journal you know and there could be several journals which are named as international journal global journal world journals they may not be even worth considering that they are journals you know so uh, somehow we created at that time a culture called as publish or perish you know? and that created a compulsion or desperation to publish you know? and uh, Uh, while it was again uh, considered uh, in good uh, spirit or for good purpose well meaning you know still it led to in uh, 2018 ugc regulation about academic integrity one of the very good regulation which ugc came forward uh, which talks about first time the uh, plagiarism how to handle it uh, how to do similarity check how to avoid plagiarism what could be the punishments about plagiarism what are the levels of acceptability of similarity and etc etc you know and during the same time uh, while i was not at ugc i was at pune university we did a study ugc had come out with a list of uh, uh, approved list of journals you know and we 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 actually analyzed that list and we showed in 2018 that 88% of the journals which were in the approved list of ugc were uh, predatory or dubious you know and this was shocking and this was bringing all kind of bad reputation to our country uh, journals like science and nature uh, wrote editorials and articles uh, uh, showing that how maximum more and more number of indian authors are falling prey to these predators and it was really very very awkward situation for all uh, there were questions in the parliament and uh, that time minister also asked a question in the vice chancellor conference that i heard uh, that now we are going to also consider chanda mama and champak as uh, research journals you know I mean, this kind of a situation was there when uh, i joined ugc you know my first priority was to fix this and therefore uh, uh, you will see that uh, the ugc care uh, came in force you know and i'll talk about it a uh, little later but uh, ugc care really uh, uh, try to fix this in a bit so the i am i'll come again back to the desperation to publish you know again i will repeat that temptation to taking shortcut is not advisable publication or phd thesis is not for name and fame for position and authority for in some kind of foreign tours or committee membership or grants and funds or promotions or academic elections or increments no these are all uh, coincidentally you know they, they could not be our purpose you know and uh, the predatory publishing you know we witnessed during last uh, uh, especially during last 10 15 years uh, and when we tried to curb that uh, by creating well meaning uh, mechanisms such as uh, uh, the ugc list of approved journals etc you know i would uh, uh, tell you that the Uh, api for promotion and eligibility condition focus on compliance the, when we give regulation the uh, the focus becomes on compliance and the compliance focus tempts people to take shortcuts and uh, therefore pay and publish culture emerged and all these journals you know which were created and you will be surprised and you may know also many of these journals actually are fake you know they don't have whatever they show on the website the information is actually not correct the names of the editors which we put in may not even exist you know so practically it became like a nigerian lottery scam and all of a sudden you also may have noticed many of you may have noticed that during 2010 15 uh, many of us started getting emails uh, saying that uh, we recognized your academic excellence and all and therefore you are requested to come on our editorial board and name of these journals were very fancy international journal of x y z global journal and all all that kind of stuff and many of uh, us at that time have fallen prey uh, to this kind of a gimmick you know so pay and publish trash culture uh, was uh, uh, very very essential to curb and uh, uh, therefore we converted the approved list uh, to a reference list of quality journals so today you see on the ugc website or care website what we give is reference list of quality journals so it is up to you 
you know ugc why ugc should decide which journals are good and bad you know it is up to the academic fraternity it is about the university when somebody is uh, giving interview it is the job of the selection committee and the vice chancellor uh, to see at the micro level whether the quality of research work is good and not only where that person has published it you know so the responsibility we have put or the onus we have put back on the university academic leadership uh, because if we try to regulate i remember the cobra effect you know you may know that during british period in delhi this is known as cobra effect uh, there were too many cobras uh, in that area and so british government Uh, announced a prize if somebody kills a cobra and bring the dead cobra they used to get some money and then the result was initially cobras uh, genuinely people were catching killing and getting a reward but then people found out that there is a good economic model business model in it and they started actually cultivating cobras you know and cultivating cobras and then killing them and then getting the money you know so this kind of a cultivating cobras today the same model was used by predatory publishers they came out with more and more such bad journals and they tried to lure uh, the uh, academic community uh, uh, and actually sold uh, uh, these uh, publications and it went to such a extent that if somebody wants to improve api of last year you know journals were ready and even today some of them are ready to improve your api by giving you back dated publications also so we made a mockery of this scientific research and publications and uh, therefore academic misconduct became very very important handling that typically academic misconduct is a data fabrication falsification of results or misleading uh, research uh, subjects or conflicts of interest hiding conflicts of interest these are some of the uh, uh, important challenges we have to really uh, address you know uh and most of the, of the key drivers if you look at why this kind of academic misconduct is uh, happening the key drivers are competition you know i want to become professor i want to uh, become highest cited uh, somebody you know all these competition the priority claims i want to do it first before somebody else do it you know for prestige for high achievement uh, for high value commercial gains in that case so there are several so a culture of honesty and integrity is needed to maintain the highest standards of ethical practice and behavior increasing pressure or desperation to publish resulted in a rapid increase in the number of research publications in predatory journals and that brought lot of disreputation to our country policies and procedures for ensuring good research practices are needed and violations of any good practice must be addressed in a fair timely and transparent fashion and we hope that with this uh, national research foundation all this will be fixed more effectively the underlying values are also important ethics you know safeguard dignity rights safety and privacy of researchers participants in the researchers the rigor of research which ensures high quality in design reliable data and appropriate methodology rigorous and careful analysis the transparent reporting and interpretation in the results or proper interpretation of the results without getting temptation to overblow whatever we have observed you know but the relevance is also important the environment and ecosystem the public and global good the science and society what relevance my research is to the society this question always has to be back of our mind and transparency honesty will be promoted through transparency in a fair full and unbiased fashion respect also is important aligned with the norms and traditions of society and its cultural heritage uh, the independence uh, the, the, because we have to insulate research from the undue influence of funders just because somebody is funding doesn't mean that they should influence and there are uh, references even today that most of the clinical research which has happened you know most of the time the results have gone in favor of the funders you know? so these are the issues ethical issues which we must address accountability becomes also important uh, comply with relevant rules and procedures such as regulations of governing professional standards is also important uh, there are several uh, websites and several uh, i would say resources which are available uh, for example committee on publication ethics commonly known as cope gives excellent resources uh for publication ethics you know uh, the publication misconduct actually as i told you is fabrication falsification or plagiarism in proposing performing or reviewing research or in reporting research results as well 
typically plagiarism is appropriation of another person's ideas processes results or words without giving appropriate credit and now we are also hearing the terms like guest authors host authors gift authorship conflicts of interest all this comes under the publication ethic again i am not going to go in more details but the predatory journal i must give credit to jeffrey bial with whom i had pleasure of interacting uh, jeffrey bial uh, used to come out with a bial's list uh, of predatory journals and i was part of a international exercise where we will develop a definition of what predatory journal is and our article was published in nature main edition and those who are interested can really uh, refer to that article in nature so while on one side uh, during last decade our image was tarnished in the international community regarding publication ethics plagiarism and academic misconduct in this decade we have seen to it that through efforts like here uh, the international community has started looking at it more seriously and also appreciating you know our efforts but still the cases continue if you look at retraction watch you know retraction watch has about 32000 retraction remember retraction meaning after you publish something if somebody points out some deficiencies or some misconduct in your research that article is withdrawn by the journal which has published it earlier you know so retraction is most humiliating and you will find that today in the database 32000 retraction exists so you can imagine the extent of this uh, academic integrity compromise you know uh, and out of this about 211 are related to covid so just during last two years 220 uh, articles have been uh, withdrawn uh, which are reported in retraction watch i was very unhappy actually hurt uh, and saddened to also read one of the recent case which was published in retraction watch in which a phd student remember phd student has written actually that i need a publication in order to submit my thesis and for that purpose the author has admitted stealing of a manuscript from somebody else's work and all this was exposed by the retraction watch website and you will find that data available uh, at their website uh, 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 while at ugc we had to make one criminal complaint in delhi police because one of the companies was actually selling pads and selling pads means unfortunately they had made a pad also if you want a good phd uh, x is a price if you want a moderately better pad y price if you want a uh, very good pad this is the price and the price range was starting from 4000 rupees for publication to 50000 1 lakh rupee for pad now what is this we are doing friends we are making mockery of it please let me tell you that if you are tempted to this kind of a shortcut to publish in predatory journals your entire academic career will be ruined and please don't do that you may have that made that mistake please don't even cite your uh, predatory publications in your bio data because today at the highest level when people look at the bio data if they see that publications from such dubious journals are there you will lose your chance even to get called for interview so this is a very serious business and uh, ugc as a regulatory body has looked into it very carefully and the consortium for academic and research ethics uh, please visit that website and see uh you can also read my world view article in nature which is also available now on the nature website uh as ugc we took a what in management they call it as kapa capa corrective and preventive action the purpose of kapa is to collect information analyze information identify and investigate product and quality problems and take appropriate and effective corrective and preventive action to prevent its recurrence in the past normally kappa principle is used in pharmaceutical industry but we use the same principle in academic world uh, and uh, kappa is a overall effort to investigate and correct quality issues uh, to prevent recurrence and uh, uh, you know, the care is one of the uh, prominent outcome all of you must also visit ugc website uh, to see a uh, document a uh, guideline document which we have published known as good academic research practices this was published in september 2030 in collaboration uh, with uh, uh, one of the reputed uh, 
a science uh, database company uh, called Clarivet, which publishes uh, Web of Science and many other. The impact factor also belongs to them, actually. So in short, I will end by saying that, again, creativity and scientific research is for search of truth, creation of new body of knowledge. It is also about pleasure, devotion, and never-ending quest for innovation. Please don't reduce it down to about only game of publication or race, or please don't get desperate, you know, or to get recognitions uh, just for uh, research should not be based on all these parameters. As I mentioned, socioeconomic benefits are also very vital, but they should be natural outcomes of your research. With this, I will uh, end my talk again by thanking uh, Ignu and Professor Nageshwar Rao, who is one of the good friends and colleagues, uh, uh, who is very efficiently handling by Shantar of Ignu for conducting this kind of exciting uh, lecture series uh, to expedite implementation of one of the most transformational policy which uh, we have received from Dr. Kasturi Rantan from National Education Policy 2020. With this, I wish you all the best and Namaskar Jai Hind, Jai Bharat.